Welcome to Moss Marketing Monday, a.k.a. the M3 Podcast. Brought to you by Moss Marketing Group. Bringing you everything marketing every Monday. Stay tuned for marketing tips and tricks you can use today. The M3 Podcast, marketing knowledge to help you succeed. Let's get started. Welcome back to the M3 Podcast. This week, we are sitting with the MMG crew. Part yeah, of it. Part of it. Some part of it. it. Yeah. It's getting pretty big now. It's actually okay. a small fraction of it now. Very small <laughs> fraction of the MMG crew. We got Dre. We got Ricky. We got Dalton. And today, it's been a little while since we've done one of these, but we are going to discuss different topics in marketing in 2024. And I think a lot of times people find facts online and it's from 2020, it's from 2017, and it's, I should be doing this. And it's funny how many people I run into that they're saying that they found this online, they should be doing this. And we go find the actual article that they read and they're five years behind. So I want to talk about what's currently happening in this space. There's a lot going on from all the different social platforms to Google, to content creation, to coming up with ideas, to AI. I mean, the list goes on and on with what is encompassed in marketing right now. So what's the first topic you want to start on, Dalton? Put you on the hot seat. Well, I mean, I think one of the bigger topics is AI, like utilizing AI going forward. I mean, obviously a lot of people are already utilizing AI, but I think it's just going to keep growing and growing and growing um, as the years go on. So, um, I, I mean, that's a broad topic though. Like, it is. That's a, And I think in the, there's still people that even look at AI right now that they still don't even really understand what it is and what it can do. And I think right now the AI with automation mm. and marketing is going to become really, really big. And it's all, it's already big. It's people understanding how to leverage it to become more efficient in today's space. Absolutely. So I think that there are a, a lot of companies that are going to be able to run thinner with less manpower and achieve more from, I mean, a lot of different verticals. So, what are you seeing AI wise from just strictly the marketing side, not the content creation side, but the marketing side? Well, I mean, just one thing that I do work in day in and day out is uh, Google Performance Max uh, campaigns, which aren't new. You know, I think they've been around for a little bit now, but um, they definitely leverage AI uh, with smart bidding. Um, and uh, I don't know, I guess it would be easy for me just to read off this shit. <laughs> but because <laughs> there's a lot and I'm still learning this myself. So yeah, basically performance max just drives, uh, based on specific conversion goals. Um, and you can set a value on that goal. So basically you set the parameters that you want, you know, the spending parameters, the value parameters, and basically Google uses its AI to create audiences for you. And, uh, it also takes, you know, I think most people think of Google ads and they think of like, oh, search campaigns. When I search on Google, that's what comes up. But with Performance Max, it's like YouTube ads, search ads, um, just direct sales ads, uh, conversions at conversion ads in itself. So there's like a huge spectrum of things and Performance Max takes all that data, combines it into one ad and then distributes it based on, you know, what you want for your ROI. So. And I think that's, I think when you say like, yeah, I can read this because there's so much on it. And yeah, and, and that doesn't even touch the surface of what no, it does. Like that, that, is, that was like a, a bad summary, <laughs> a bad summary of it. <laughs> and it's, it's something we could have. I mean, there's hour, hour long videos all over YouTube about just looking at the topic of building performance max ads. Yeah. So if that's something you want to deep dive into more, I mean, there's videos all over the place to mm -hmm. go watch to, to learn more about those. But I think that just really hits on like the actual learning curve of marketing. Yeah. And we talk about it all the time with business owners that are like, well, we're just going to hire one person just to run it in house because we think it's going to save us money. And they don't have an expert in Google that you can run circles around me in Google because you um, operate in it yeah, and every I'm still single learning, day. Still learning. Like it's it's a learning curve for sure. Just the, the shift in the last six months has been so crazy Yeah. with those ads that that is something that you have to be working with someone that is inside of those every single day that understands the changes that are com coming that understands yeah. those the how they run and operate because 
I don't understand them like I right. used to because they've came so far. In mm-hmm. You know, what they, years. they don't tell you about performance max campaigns is if you just set up a new Google ads account and try to start running them, it doesn't really work. Yeah. You actually need data though. And you need like your conversion ROIs. Like uh, I, this, this comes from someone from Google, you know, themselves. So they're like, yeah, you, you shouldn't just start running a performance max. Like it's not going to benefit you in any way. Like you need, you need data, you need an audience, like, and then it builds that, you know, builds upon that. So that was one thing when I started doing this, you know, a while back, like I had all these performance max campaigns built out and I'm like, these things suck. <laughs> like they're not doing shit. And I called the lady and she's like, yeah, you shouldn't be, you, you need like three months of this ad account, you know, running your normal ads. And then you can start building the performance max, which was like all these, you know, people on, you know, Googling stuff, you know, YouTube in it, they didn't say that. So, yeah. And I, um, and I mean, I see you every single week on the, on the phone with Google going through these different ad accounts, going through mm. these different objections or these different goals that you have with these different accounts because every account we have has different goals and like different yeah. outcomes of what we're looking to do for sure and that's having somebody that can be on the phone every week to say hey we're we're with that learning curve and and that's not even talking google as a whole that's literally mm-hmm. talking like one type of ad yeah that we could have a whole entire podcast on just those yeah. and then then direct search and how that looks and what the bidding style looks like the Google is a, a huge auction house mm-hmm. towards when we're talking with clients, I'm always telling them the one thing you have to be careful is if you put all of your eggs in the, the basket of Google and you're in that auction house all the time, somebody comes in that wants to outbid you yep. and say your Google provides 20 new leads a month that's converting 10 sales and you bank on that all the time for X amount of dollars. And then all of a sudden someone else comes in the space or maybe two or three other people come in the space and they start bidding. And then all of a sudden you go from 20 leads down to five and then you're converting one or two. Now all of a sudden the, the whole game just changed. For sure. And it's like you're at the mercy of being in that auction house. So that's, I think marketing as a whole needs to be diversified to where you have your hand in all these different areas to see what works best and what you can leverage that some companies we have do really, really well on Google. Some companies do way better on social. It just depends on what the company is and how that company runs and operates. But sure. I think the the Google side is it. I mean, that also with the AI. I mm-hmm. mean, AI now with just the automation side of, like you said, working on audiences. And I think that's a that's definitely a topic I want to talk on again okay. when we get into the data side during this conversation but having that also for helping build out the ad creative and the the wording that goes with these posts today i was just talking about the ai that has been implemented on linkedin now you can just type out everything you want and then just click ai regenerate and then just rewords and it's like oh wow that sounds great like now you can update your whole profile and you just click on the bio i had this bio that i wrote like probably four years ago. <laughs> I bet it was awesome. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't awesome. I click on it today and just like rewrite it, reformulates the whole thing. It's like it, it was written for a book. I'm like, wow, that sounds way better. And it took me uh, five seconds. The The time that things can be done, now a single work day, you can get done what used to take weeks <clears throat> by understanding how to utilize that. Now you take that over 10 people you can have 10 people get done what it used to take 70 people to get done in, in our vertical of what we're doing. So, uh, Ricky, what is your topic? So one of the things with kind of segueing from AI is that there's a lot of really big brands that are bringing AI in house now. So like, I feel like six, eight months ago, when did chat GBT like go mainstream? I would say it's probably about a year ago now. Yeah. So Something like, like that. I started like, I think that's when people started getting into it. Yeah, obviously and, it was around before yeah. and all the, I'm sure there's people out there that were already in it and yeah. knew before everybody else. But uh, when it went mainstream, there was ChatGBT and then a few like little image prompting type things started popping up. But everything was like on its own platform and you didn't really know what you were going to get. Like, is it going to be some stupid site that you're going to get? <laughs> 
scammed like with the uh, the AI generations of the like ca- cartoon characters. I've got yeah. scammed by quite a few of those. <laughs> like I've, there's, I've seen a sweet ad on them and I, it does it. And I'm like, whoa, mine didn't turn out anything like that. But the point is there's like 50 different things like all sounding like they do the same thing. Now Photoshop, as they started with their Firefly and now they have a bunch of tools that are already inside of Photoshop. Like the bigger companies like Google with their AI, mm-hmm. Notion has a built-in AI. There's a lot of platforms that have it now and you don't have to go somewhere else to get it. I think that's what we're gonna see shifting in the next like six more months is you don't have to be on some weird site to use ChatGPT. It's already built into LinkedIn or whatever it is. And I think they're they're also doing plugins, which in the beginning, I didn't really understand how plugins worked and how I could start just connecting it into everything. Mm-hmm. That when I'm sitting on my computer and I get an email, I can click on my email and I have a green button that is a Chrome extension that is ChatGPT clicked in. I I just click generate email to where if I have an email, that's pretty broad that it's, it's not super in depth. It's not asking me a bunch of questions. I just need a reply. I can just click that. It generates something out or I can write out what I want and then click auto generate. And then it just, I use it more as like a grammarly kind of deal Mm -hmm. that that's my biggest thing is when you're sending out a lot of emails in a day, I mean, you can be sitting there just typing out and you can make those grammatical errors. It's nice having chat GPT plugged in there that that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. That you're sending out perfect emails one after another. Yeah. It's I, and, yeah, almost pretty crazy. I sometimes use it, like I'll write my email and then throw it into the chat GPT just to get it like to sound better. Yeah. You know, whatever tone I want to use, you can obviously everyone knows you can you know, have yeah. me do that, but j- just as a grammatical tool basically. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's pretty amazing. So what I know like on the content side, I know Dalton was talking on the marketing forefront, but On the content side, I think there is, I've seen some stuff that works well, and I've seen some stuff that works really bad on the content. So I think that content, there's definitely a lot more room for growth. We're a ways out. It's it's cool and it's impressive because it's just something that hasn't really been done before, but it's still, uh, it's not great. Yeah, it it struggles (laughs) with like, in chat GPT, you have Dolly, and Mm -hmm. it struggles a lot with like faces it struggles really bad with like spelling of words. And I will say like on the the verbiage side, when you're putting stuff in chat GPT and it's, you want something changed, you can adjust that tone. You can really fine tune what you're looking to get out pretty quickly. Uh, I have not figured out the photo side at all. I'll be like, hey, you spelled this wrong. And it kicks out a completely different image with the word. I You even put in like quotations, like how you want it spelled. It's still wrong. Like, this is Dolly in particular. Yeah. Dolly. Yeah, I okay. I may just have. I haven't used it yet, but today I was working with it again, and it's just I feel like it for ChatGPT to work so well in a certain aspect. I feel like that's so far off. It's definitely behind, but language is just like by design more simple than a visual. Yeah, a visual uh, result. I think we're gonna see that. People, there's a lot of businesses out there in particular that know what they are doing marketing wise right now on social doesn't work. It's crazy. I've sat down with businesses that are paying companies that they know what they're getting doesn't work, but they like it because it's the cheapest option. Like it kind of blows my mind. Like I met with a company up north here that has been around for a hundred plus years and they have not been able to break a hundred followers on any of their social platforms. And they were posting the most boring shit you've ever seen. So like, but they were the cheapest option. I'm like, I, I, you're better off doing nothing. But I, I have a feeling a lot of those companies that are already giving a very piss poor product are just going to shift to these AI photos. It might even be worse. Uh, and that's where I'm kind of like, you're seeing it some some places where they're dropping these. I'm like, you're getting one out of every. I don't know, 25, 50 photos maybe that you're trying to get out comes out the way that you're wanting it. So it's still very low Mm -hmm. like percentage. But I feel like when that starts adjusting up, people are going to think that's their new saving grace to do it the cheapest way possible. I do feel like you're going to see a lot of social platforms like already like start flooding with these AI generated photos that are just so cartoon like. And and once I, I think they're cool when they're done when it comes out right. What is the uh, one that everyone's using for LinkedIn profile pictures? So there's an AI one where it's like you just plug in like five photos of yourself and it kicks out like 
actually good photos. Oh, like essentially like a headshot. Yeah. Guy? Yeah. Interesting. It was, it was so, the app thing. So now you have these people that have photos that look absolutely nothing like them. They look like they're a, the like, like king of Wall like Street. Perfect. Yeah. Just like <laughs> he's like, and then you see him in person, you're like, whoa, you don't look like that profile picture. But they, they don't look AI generated. They and look real. You gotta, you gotta pull that up. That sounds interesting. Yeah, I, I, I have not seen this. Um, I get asked for it all the time. Sure. I know, actually, like. Uh, Good luck finding it now. <laughs> yeah. I have a single guy that I know that, like, did it. We won't put it on here, but I'll let you guys see it. <laughs> you know how it used to be the. I don't know if it was a commercial or whatever it was, but it's like, a, there's an app for that. Yeah. There's an AI for that. There's an AI for that. Uh, so, I, Insta Headshot. I would not know. Like, I haven't really. Oh, wow. So it actually, I from everything I've seen, and because I saw it on uh, Instagram Reels, of course, I saw it on there, and people do it, and it looks ninety percent. It looks like a real person. So it looks ninety percent I mean, like of them, and it. They're saying that's going to be the new way of getting headshots moving forward. Because if you can do that, say it costs five dollars. So this right. guy did one because you probably just take a few different photos of your face, right? Different yeah, angles. that's all you do, and just plug it in. Uh, that's what it actually look like, looks like. Okay, uh, that's what he actually looks like. No, he does not look like that. What's he actually look like? Yeah, I mean the AI photos do drop like a good like. 30, 40 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, there's going to be a whole new world of catfishing going on out there that we're going to have to watch out for. Actually, I don't sure have to watch people out are for using it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not in the dating space in today's world. That would be yeah. rough. It would be. Yeah. So, um, make sure you I, watch out for that. <laughs> I had a question because I have not even attempted to use it, but uh, video editing AI? Is that, oh, yeah. Is that, how's that? Uh, so, it's okay in a couple ways so far. Uh, the podcast stuff is awesome. It's I would hardly call it AI from the aspect of like doing the multicam cutting and everything, because as far as I know right now, it's just based off of the audio tracks. So it's not it's, is it impressive? Yes. Is it super impressive? Not really. Not yet. But what you can do is take like long form podcasts like this and chop out a piece that has like captions and uh, in a short form. So it like pulls out what it wants to say. That's also not awesome yet, but it's a lot better than it was six months ago. So I, I was going to say, it's come a long way. It, it completely has. It's it, not. In the beginning when you did that and you put in an hour long podcast, it would kick out 15 reels and all 15 the, of them were not usable. The now, captions like spelled wrong and stuff. No, the, it was just like they didn't make sense on half mm -hmm. of them. Like it always pulls out your intro like as a reel, like it would pull out the most random things mm -hmm. that you watch it and it would like try to piece something together that if you watch it, you would just be confused. I, I, I can see that because I, don't, I just, obviously there's different levels of it, but like a, a computer AI generally doesn't get like contextually like what we mean. But, so it doesn't like, yet, but it's a, I it's think a some super of them intelligence. Do. Yeah, some can. of them do. No, I, I'm saying there's some that are powerful enough to do that, but I don't because think like, Six that months ago, one. you didn't get a not, reel. Not very many. Now you're getting one or two. Yeah. Towards, I feel like the the speed of which it learns. Well, it just has to have more feedback. Yeah. It's a it's a super learning machine. Right. It's gonna get better. You know what this makes yeah. me think of? The movie Eagle Eye. I, I haven't about seen to say that. Terminator. No. I was thinking <laughs> I Robot. I was thinking <laughs> I Robot too. Uh, Eagle Eye. Well, it's probably yeah. Anyways, it's just like this machine that like learns people's habits and can like basically learn how to do anything it wants to and. Well, I would say like, just think about how good the text based to pull out a reel or something like that. Essentially, it's just pulling out a key point and making a summary of it yeah. that it thinks somebody is going to want to watch. And like you could have it summarize an entire book almost instantly now or summarize an email yeah. and pull out the key points. It's the same thing with video. It's just transcribing it first. Yeah, I think that I've had a lot of people come my way, like other business owners and like, do you fear AI like? taking your guys' job. I was like, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like in the marketing space, at a high level, there's marketing minds out there of how marketing truly works to individuals, that there is a strategy and there is a ability to do it well. Now, there are marketing agencies out there that will be shut down, 100%. Like, those cheesy graphic companies that charge people $500 a month, 
like those are going to go by the wayside really quickly. The AI is just going to be able to auto, auto generate what they're doing. Well, it's almost and like it's, the people that their sole job was just blog posts for websites. Like yeah. that, that's what you got paid to do. However much it was, AI came out. That job's essentially gone because now it knows the exact keywords to plug into your website to make it the most efficient as possible. And so those jobs are just gone overnight. And it, it can scrub sites. Like if I say I want to write a blog post on whatever it is. And that's saying that if SEO was working like it used to also. I mean, the, the world of writing blog posts all the time is it still can get done, but it's such a small piece on the big scale because now you can sit there and say, hey, here's my 10 competitors. Here's all their websites. I need blog posts to make sure I outrank them on all these keywords. And so I'll write out all the blog posts you need for the next six months. And so I'll be able to do it in five minutes. To where it's like, we've had clients and like, well, would you be able to, we spend two grand a month over here writing blog posts. I'm like, somebody's getting you. Because, and then mm -hmm. there's also gonna be the people out there like, well, websites read if it's written by AI. Yeah, there's also AIs you can put it into to make it to where the internet can't see that it was written by AI where it's like understanding how to do the whole entire thing is very crucial to do it and do it correctly. But it's like, I do think that's a, that's a space that there was, there were people that had jobs doing that at one point and 12 months ago, their probably jobs are getting a little scarce. Well, people, I think it's really just about like, there's still people doing that, but there's less people doing more of the work and they're able to do way more of it because of the AI. So whoever adapts the quickest, which yeah. is what we'll do, is gonna get leverage from it. Whereas, yeah, if you try to ignore it, yeah, it's not gonna be good. Which I think there are a lot of people trying to ignore it right now. And it's the same thing with like the content space where people aren't adapting to the video formats. Like if you're posting videos and every single video you post says turn your phone sideways, <laughs> like you're missing the mark. Like totally. the, the internet's telling you what it wants. Like, and that's what marketing is, is understanding how to capture people's attention and understanding the feedback. De depending on what your goal is. Like if there's creators out there that are just wanting to share what they do and it's turn your phone yeah. sideways, it's like, ah, whatever. Yeah. But if you're trying to do that like on a business forefront and your goal is to make more sales, then it's a no-no. Yeah. So in 2023, how many marketers surveyed do you think uh, used AI for content creation? In 2023? 2023. For content creation? It's it, this, this says AI for content creation, such as writing blog posts, articles, websites, oh. social media copies. So basically just use it in general. So including written form? Including written form. I'm going to say 90%. 74%. So I was surprised too. Ricky, what's your, uh, what's your guess? Are we on the wrong side of the spectrum? Uh, yeah. Oh, shit. Wrong side. Slower. 35. 48%. Mm, wow. So, so I feel like that's the company. <laughs> I feel like that's low, but it follows it up with Didn't Chat GBT come out in like twenty two? That's what it, we, like, we don't yeah, know late twenty two, I think. I'm not sure. Like but so fast forwarding to twenty twenty four, eighty eight percent of people they surveyed marketers are planning on leveraging it this year. So that's the the jump. That, you know the funny thing is how many people say they're going to do something? <laughs> like, well, that's another story. It's, it's really <laughs> easy to say, hey, we interviewed you. Yeah, we don't use it right now, but we're going to. We're going yeah. to. They're going to decide that they think they should use it once they close. Like when you are waiting and you are this far behind right now, which 100% the reason I created Moss Marketing Group was marketing agencies in our area are so far behind on what they are doing that it's like baffling almost. And the funny thing is we sit here and we have a podcast every week. We talk about these things. We tell people how to do it. You could become 10 times the marketer listening to this one episode of knowing what's going on in the space. And you have people out there that are, you know, I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm going to start in the gym here next month, <laughs> next month. Well, they're, they're already that the last a year years. behind. It's going to take them how long to figure out what websites work, what ones don't, which Luckily, we have a team of everyone going through that. What? I don't I don't know if the early adoption is as huge of a, like if the intelligence is getting smarter and it's getting faster, you're gonna be able to learn it. You're gonna, like getting into AI now, we have an advantage over the next yeah. few years. Over the long term though, 
Oh yeah, like, definitely, definitely over the next. Few I don't years. think it's the be learning insane. curve in AI is like anything that astronomical. I think there's definitely ways to like a lot of things that we implement that we've became more efficient with using it because you could spend a lot of time sitting there entering things into chat GPT to try to get what you you want your output. But at the end of the day, AI is only as good as the input that you're giving it. It's a tool. It, it is a tool. And there's, yeah. there's people that you could give a table saw to and they have no earthly idea how to use it. Same thing with chat GPT. You could give it to anyone. Anyone has access to go use it. That doesn't mean that they're going to know how to use it. That early days of when we started using it, I mean, our input input wasn't correct. We weren't getting the output we were looking for. Yeah. But as we've progressed and we've worked on what those inputs look like, it's really increased what our output is. And we've understood how to leverage it more and more and more and more. And we're going to continue to get better at it. So it's like I, I do think there is a a lot of people can use it, but I think early days of it we're uh, like hey I mean, we're wasting my, time actually using my efficiency <laughs> in it is like night and day of what it was yeah like i i per, like this could be completely wrong i don't know but like no detail like is too small for it like no. if it doesn't want to use it it's not going to use it but that one little detail could like completely change you know the copy that comes out of it or yeah. whatever so and, and you have to keep in mind like this unless it's scrubbing the actual website and then that's going to depend on the type of copy that's on the website but it doesn't have the full con the full uh, context that you no. have when you're looking no. at a brand so like the more detail and the more you can give it that's that's all it has to go off of. yeah yeah but i I've, I've just found that like even like like stupid details that you think would you wouldn't say to a person when you're trying to explain it to them if you say it to the ai it tends to just give me something better than if i wouldn't have that weird but like i mean i'll even like just little weird shit like i'll put in i don't even have an <laughs> you example. gotta you gotta have an example. I, would, I just <laughs> little weird <laughs> stuff dude yeah. just like a just a trivial fact or trivial like piece of information that you would i don't know <laughs> what i'm I'll, picturing come back to it i'm yeah. picturing you doing something for nsk and you're like brett the owner his favorite color is blue <laughs> i mean dude even facts about like someone you're writing yeah, yeah. i mean facts about them like I don't, maybe this isn't like super, but I'll be like, I'll make sure to tell it like, Hey, this is the dim I'll tell it where this ad is or this copy is going to be used. But like, remember the demographic of this area and the people that I'm going after, or moreover, the people I'm going after in this area, like to define it more. Hmm. I think that, that's, that's, that's not quite a trivial thing to put on there, but sounded better than the color blue. Yeah. <laughs> it, I'm just saying like, no, basically the moral of the story is there's just and, as many details as you can feed it. The I think also what output. changed my biggest change I found in chat GPT of the whole time using it was when I was putting those inputs in, ask me additional questions that you need to know. Okay. Well, yeah, I hadn't even. So it's like when I started doing fact. that, it was like, this is what I'm looking to get out. And I put in all the info I have, what additional information do you need? to get what I'm looking for. And then it'll start asking you questions. I'm like, oh, I didn't think about that. That's a good point. Yeah. Like I assumed it would put that in there. Like, it, and it'll start asking it's like, a great suggestion. Where's the city that this is at? Where, what is the, how long have they been in business? And it starts asking all these questions, but it's the same things that we ask a client if we were building it out to where it runs and operates the same way as if you sat here and you gave me a one word sentence and you want to output from me, I'd be like, Pfft. What are we talking about? Like, and then it spits something out. They're like, damn, that's not what I was looking for. <laughs> it's like, no <laughs> shit. <Yeah. laughs> like, are you surprised? And most people are. They're like, yeah, chat GPT doesn't work. It's like, you just don't understand it well enough. And that's just such a small fraction of the overall marketing movement. That is just like one thing that we can build out to be more efficient. So it's like, I remember when it first started, people were like, well, is marketing just gonna be a lot cheaper now because of chat GPT? I was like, no. I was like, if anything, it's getting more expensive because there's few people that know how to use it correctly. But also coming back to the content side, content is not somebody that AI is not gonna be able to replace people on cameras. Ricky's- At least this right. year. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. And, and then, yeah. But I think that's future. like something that putting people on camera in businesses and having that personal side to a business is what wins in today's world. And I think in business today, people have gotten so into 
selling their product or their service down people's throats and they don't get the return. So they jump ship on all marketing. And it's because you have to sell the personality. You have to sell the values. Why does someone buy from a company? They buy because the people that they interact with. You could have the best product in the world. And if you showed up and you were just the biggest piece of shit that I've ever met, I wouldn't buy from you. I don't care how great your product is. And it's like people buy from people. There's people that drive Teslas just because they follow Elon and they think that everything he does is gold. So they're going to drive Tesla. People buy from people. People buy the values. People buy all of that. And that is where the personal touch of marketing, I feel like, is lost right now. I feel like there's so much noise that people think just throwing out there that if your toilet's leaking, call me. <laughs> and it's like, wh why am I going to call you when there's 50 other plumbers in my area that also do the exact same thing? And it's like the car business is the worst when it's you have 60 F-150s. The guy down the street has 60 F-150s. The dealer over there has 60 F-150s. Why do they buy from you? And then they put out the same ads like, we have a service department. Yeah, so does every other one of the other guys. Towards what are the value points that someone would come there and shop with you over the next guy? So I think that's what the misconception is, is I think a lot of companies think just putting something out is better than nothing. So that's what a lot of dealers pay for a corporate one, which is good. There's good facts on it. It does everything where it says what you're supposed to do, but it brings no personal value, which they are doing something. Is it converting as well as it should? No, just because everyone down the street's doing the same thing. So everything just looks identical. Um, but that's where we, We've talked about bringing personalities, not just dealerships to businesses. There's a business, a business right up the street from here. Their reels popping off today just because what that video is relates to almost anyone that owns a business. So it's right now, I, I think going after the correct demographic organically without even have, having to do paid ads behind it. Yeah. And I think, I think right now we're in the hardest marketing space that we've ever been in. Because I think there's more noise right now than ever before. And I think there's more market confusion than ever before. I think people are being touched with so many different avenues of marketing right now that from a business owner standpoint, that they're getting emails all the time. They're getting served with ads on social all the time. They're seeing commercials on things. They're seeing radio. They, they, there's a lot of older business owners that still think radio and TV is the direction to go. And it's like you look at your ROI on those. The only TV commercial that you should pay money for that would work in today's time is a Super Bowl commercial. People aren't watching commercials like they used to. Well, I kind of forget that people pay for TV commercials. Yeah. And it's kind of mind blowing of how much a lot it of money. Is. But it's like you look at, I mean, we've had in our, in my email box, I've had resumes come from some of the top TV stations in Kansas City, resumes from their head of marketing leaving or getting let go. It's because the, the space is drying up. Radio is falling down. The cost to get on radio is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Five, 10 years ago, it was expensive to be on the radio. Now, it's not very expensive to be on the radio. Didn't like three radio stations just go bankrupt? Like I did see, uh, huh. is 95.7 gone? It, it was one because the someone uh, main I, I saw like a city. Facebook post the other day. It's like, what happened to 95.7? And now that <laughs> but, you say that, I'm like, maybe it. But there, <laughs> there's yeah. radio stations that are going under. And then it's like you have business owners that are talking about advertising that way. And it's like mind blowing that in, in our world now, I haven't listened to an ad with music since 18 years old, 19. Spotify used to be like four dollars a month. Now it's like yeah, twelve. That's a student discount, bro. I know. <laughs> but that I mean, Dre still listens to ads on Pandora. I'm not gonna. I don't listen to Pandora very much, but <laughs> I, I do have it, and it's not. It's the free version. So, but it's like I look at people pay for Spotify, <laughs> not Pandora. <laughs> know your clientele. But I, I don't. I do not listen to radio. But I, mean, I think people all. were tired that the radio got so just ad driven that it was just saturated that if you got like, if you're driving to work and you thought like you're going to listen to music, 
Yeah, right. Oh, it's like right. they would hit Not from every fucking station. 7.30 to <laughs> 9.30. Commercial. It's like talk show brought to you by, and then just add, add, add. And then it's like you get one song, add, add, add. I was like, <laughs> you, you know, I, I, I just take that back. I do listen to 98.9 sometimes. Just Johnny and Dare, though. Oh. Shout out. It's, dude, it's yeah. Hey, I, I That's a good say, show. He's built it, and I will say his following is a very and, loyal. And they following. they don't like play ads all like commercials all morning. Uh, I but think it's how many pretty, people under twenty five know who Johnny Dare is? Probably hey, not many. He'd probably be doing a lot better if he had his own platform and was just uh, nationwide instead of a radio station. Yeah, a hundred percent, hundred percent. So I look at it as like people are listening to podcasts more than radio now. Yeah, uh -huh. I mean, you go talk to twenty people off the street. I'm gonna. Bet that they've probably listened to a Joe Rogan podcast more recently than they've listened to a radio sure. like station of any sort. So it's like you look at that. So if you know that information, and I think most everyone out there agrees with these statements that we are making right now. The only way you disagree with that is if you work in that space and you're still out trying to sell those things. But if anyone else like you cannot say that more people are on streaming platforms than ever before. That is fact. Oh, that's that's a fact. OK, so. Sure. I'm I just, mean, I'm picturing the, that, the ad, the commercial sales guy every morning he gets up, he's about to go door to door <laughs> and he looks at his mirror and he says, commercials still work, commercials <laughs> still work, commercials still work. And then he uh, goes and gets rejected all day. Yeah. So it's like, you look at that Tough job, it would be, but it's like, I think what weird, I think it's in like the weird shifting phase right now mm -hmm. that we have more business owners coming to us saying like, Hey, we know we need to be doing this. We just don't understand it. TV and radio was really simple to understand. It was all salesy. It was, what's your biggest offer you have right now? And we're just gonna, you're gonna get a 15 second spot and a 30 second spot. We're gonna show up, we're gonna put them together. Yeah. We'll be here one time and it's gonna cover you for the next six months. Give your elevator pitch. Yeah, pretty much. Like, so it was super simple for the business owner. All they had to do was write a check and hit the 15 and 30 second. That was the extent of it. Nowadays, social media, you have to be putting out new content all the time. You have to be innovative. I'm talking weekly. Like you have to have new stuff coming out. You have to actually, the difference between TV and radio to what social media is, is actually willingly getting someone's time. Mm -hmm. The difference is on TV, uh, I record everything. The only thing, like I said, live sports, like so, but most time on live sports, commercials come on, you go get a drink, get food, go to the bathroom, whatever. You are not willingly getting someone's time. And I, th I think it might be easier to draw this analogy. If, like, look compared to 20 years ago, like a commercial came on and you just watched it. What else were you going to do? You didn't have yeah. a choice. Or maybe you talked to somebody that was in the room with you. It's not yeah. like you had a supercomputer in your pocket to pull out. Yeah. My, my grandparents always just mute the TV when they come yeah. on. <laughs> <Nice. laughs> but you look at that as like a TV commercial and a radio spot is taking someone's time. It's not... Like you're driving down the road and you're listening to the radio, you listen to Giant Dare, ad comes on, you're like, oh, turn it up. <laughs> no, you turn it off and you probably got on your phone, you watch, you, you're doing something, you make a phone call, and you're like, well, commercial's on. And so it's the same thing on now, if you're on social media, somebody has the ability to scroll right past what you put out. You're, you're not taking their attention. So now you have to be skilled enough to understand marketing and understand content to how do I willingly get that person's attention? Even though it's a sponsored ad, it's still willingly getting their attention to watch a video. That's where when we put videos out, we watch, we track that watch time. Make them entertaining or educational. Those are the two lines that you win in marketing. If something pops up and they're immediately trying to sell me really quick, I'm like, all right, on to the next thing. I just I don't have to watch it. And that's on that's on sponsored posts because yeah. if it's organic, nobody's going to hit follow to begin with. So you're going to be talking to the wall. Yep. So now you have no following. And I, there's people out there that have no following that pay companies to post every day to their no following and run no social ads to where if you are a company and you're spending $1,000 a month for someone to post some shitty ass graphics, save your $1,000. You have no following that for that to even reach anyways. And organic as a business most of the time, if you're not getting a high engagement rate, you're probably only reaching less than 5%. And it's probably the people in your family. You don't really need to hit them. Take that $1,000, hit the casino, and just go throw it on red or black, whichever you're feeling that day. You're going to have a better chance of making money doing that than you are putting your money at some company that's $1,000 a month that's posting some shitty graphics. Like, that's facts. 
because you go talk to those companies that are paying that. When was the last time you got a deal off of a social platform? They're like, uh, I don't think we've ever gotten a deal off a of social platform. Do people get deals off social? <laughs> it, that is like the, the crazy thing that there's people that have been paying for something that have never got a single deal. They've never got something that even comes close to working it. And they're like, then they'll cancel and then they don't believe in social media anymore. Like that's not the way to market. Why not? So I do think those people that have paid for radio, like kind of how Dalton said he follows Johnny Dare. I picture that as the modern day influencers. So sitting there with those people, it's like they have generated a loyal following that when they actually make posts, depending on what it's about, those people actually do go out and buy it. But yeah. they have the option of getting to pick and choose what products they want to take on and not. And I would I would probably say social media influencers probably make more than a radio show host. I'm going to assume. Could. I don't know for sure, but I'm going to assume. I would say so. Because most of the social media influencers, I, once they pass that 100, 200,000 people following them, you can put stuff out and... Like you said on that organic stuff, you're hitting your following and they're actually excited to see what you're putting out and want, want to see. But it. what I will say, which is happening right now, and I think it's going to con continue to happen, you know, there's a lot of big brands and, I mean, companies that do well in the digital space. Influencer marketing is tearing down. I think they're getting into this very micro influencer right now that these big influencers have gotten so money driven that the trust and the, the loyalty to them is gone. That if I follow someone and Dalton has 10,000 followers and they're here in Kansas City and Dalton posts a product and he's like, hey, this is shit. They send this to me, I don't like it. This is my honest opinion of it. That That is why someone trusts what Dalton has to say. If you're somebody that you just post all these products and they're great, and then I order a product and it's a shitty product, but it's just because you're getting paid then that trust starts failing really quickly. I will never buy another product that you that you endorse. Towards, I think that's happening in influencer marketing. I feel like these influencers at a small space like start getting a little bit of traction. They get a couple deals here and there. They are honest with them. But then all of a sudden the money gets big enough that it's like, hey, I'm gonna pay you, I'm gonna pay you 50 grand to do a video on this, and you have to say it's great or you're not getting paid. So, so then I'll <laughs> send it to us for approval first. Yeah, it goes <laughs> yeah. through like an approval cycle right. with this corporate company. Yes. Now all of a sudden it's like, I don't trust that person. They're, they're getting paid to say that. They've turned into a, a glorified politician. Did you watch Theo Vaughn on with Joe Rogan? So they were on and a company, Theo Vaughn posted his podcast and company reached out and said, you need to take that down because we don't like the individual that's on it. He's like, uh, no, he's like, you can just take your money back. And then Rogan's like, well, who is the company? He's like, uh, said the company and it was a bike company, but he had them in the UFC gym. He's like, do we have those type of bikes out there? And they're like, yeah. He's like, those will be moved out by the end of day today. He's like, if they're going to come after you for something like that, he's like, it's not a company I need to be a part of. So just for something that minuscule and basically how they wanted full control over, uh, yeah, we our values don't align with the person that's on your podcast, even though we're sponsoring you, not them. What was the brand? Uh, Peloton. Oh, okay. Sounds like a Pel Peloton's been making a lot of pretty crappy moves. Oh, I yeah. was trying to think of who Theo Vaughn would be affiliated with it. Uh, I'm actually surprised equipment. about that. It, it was, yeah. I was kind of, I was surprised. That. <laughs> I was yeah. like, okay. That's what it seemed like a weird partnership to begin with. I think they went into like bankruptcy stage and then now they've been trying to do like subscription model instead of like selling the bikes. So now they're going on like you get a subscription with them. I think they're chasing like Whoop's kind of business model where Whoop, yeah. you, you buy the subscription and you get the Whoop for free. What a deal. No, but it makes it to where like at the end of it, you still paying, you're still paying that subscription. So they get that long term. You're making money. more money and it's a lower, lower yeah. barrier to entry. So they're not trying to capture that just like product sale every time. I would assume based off zero research that Peloton had so much growth during the lockdowns and COVID and stuff that it probably like hyperinflated their business 
uh, and there weren't actually that many customers. Yeah, and then the next year they're like, you're gonna increase by 20%. I'm like, uh, the world opened back up. Everybody was That's like, not happening. actually I can't work out at home They also well. went into a big lawsuit with the treadmills. Some kid got like pulled underneath a treadmill, which I feel like that I feel like that could happen with any treadmill. treadmill. But their huh. treadmills are so heavy, like that there's like a big lawsuit on their treadmills. I don't know the outcome of that, but I do remember that being a thing. So I don't know if that had anything hey, to do with it. Any publicity is good publicity. I don't think that as was. As long as you just stay in the limelight. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that was good for him. But uh, the next thing I do want to talk on is that we, we've had a lot of additional things come to Moss Marketing Group recently. I want to talk about the data side and how important that's becoming with privacy policies tightening up in 24. I mean, a lot of things are changing on that forefront. And I don't think people really have their eye on that. And I don't think people are understanding how important the correct data is going to be in marketplace coming up. So um, with data now, I mean, there's multi-billion dollar companies out there that specialize in selling data. And it's making sure that you have the right data. If you are geofencing places, you are getting the correct data. That when you say data, like so now, like we can geofence a location. We say, hey, Ricky owns company X, and he's located right here off of I thirty five, and he wants to target every person that comes into company Y across the street because he wants to know who their clientele is, and he wants to be. He thinks he has a better value, he has better marketing, he has better way to reach those people and acquire them as customers for him, that he wants to know everyone that goes into your location every day. So we can geofence a location and ba based off of phone IP addresses, we can get your first, your last name, your phone number, your email address, your home address. It's pretty scary what you can actually do now with where these run around everywhere. When you sign that uh, your terms of your agreement that we've all read. <laughs> yeah, that's 5,000 pages long now. Those are things that they can track your phones. They can see where your phones are going. And there's also a ping percentage that happens that a lot of people don't know what they're buying into when they're geofencing something that you can find really cheap geofencing companies out there. But their ping rate is at 15%. When you say ping rate. So that's saying that out of every everyone that comes in here, so say if we just have a ping rate of 25% and four of us walked into company Y, you're only gonna catch one of them. So you're catching one of four people that actually come through there. So say that company has 100 people that come through in a day and you get 25 pieces of data. Or you can pay up and you can get a company that pings at 75%. So now we're saying that you're not gonna find somebody that pings at 100%. So now all four of us go in the same company. Why? Now you got three out of the four people that come in. Now you're, you're dealing with better data groups and you're going to have more people to go after. And that's just me walking into a location. They get all that data. Yep. So you can sit there and you can hit that on the geofencing side. Then there's also just actual data acquisition side that we've partnered with different third party companies where we can say, hey, in the automotive space, we know that Ricky owns a Ford F-150. We know Dalton owns a Ford F-150. We know Ricky's is a Platinum. We know Dalton's is a Raptor. We have their first and last names. We have home addresses. We have email addresses. We have phone numbers. We know where credit is within 50 points. We know that they're coming into equity in the next six months. So we know that we can start warming them up as someone that we want to sell to. So now how do you warm that person up into your business? And that's understanding having that data to say, hey, we're gonna start warming them up with just overall brand values that we have. We're not gonna try to sell them yet. That's what too many people try to go straight for the sell at the bottom of the funnel, and that's why they fail with marketing. Instead of trying to sell them right now, we're just gonna warm them up. We're just gonna start saying, hey, these are different values that our company has. So they're gonna be seeing that and they're gonna be like, oh, this looks like a place I'd wanna buy a vehicle from. They, I like what they're doing here. This makes a lot of sense. So once you start warming those people up, now we're no, we know that they're in an equity position. And most of the time when somebody find, gets into an equity position, that's most of the time when they're going to look at trading in their vehicle. So we know what vehicle that they own. And we know their equity position that they're in. Now we can start email drip campaigns that are coming in that state that we're paying up additional percentage of money for these certain vehicles. If you own one of these five vehicles, we'll give you an extra X on trade. So then it makes marketing way more detailed to the and personalized to that person yeah you can actually target people 
Yeah. And that's what we were talking earlier on having the correct data and the correct audiences, because we can also take those audiences and we can plug them into social platforms. We can plug them into meta and then we can target those people on social platforms too. That we can say, hey, if you have a service offering for people that own F-150s in your zip code, we can pull an audience and we can know everyone in your zip code and the surrounding three zip codes that own F-150s. And we can target them with a service incentive on Facebook and Instagram that if you own F-150, you get additional $20 off your next oil change. Now you just put a lot of new clients and with the people that are getting served with that ad, you're not serving it to what it would cost to try to target everyone or you can just target the people with the F-150s that you want to come into your service drive. So that's where I think the data side is becoming so big in marketing and companies that don't have that, their cost per ads get so out of control that you have to spend a hundred grand to try to get the same as what somebody can spend three to five grand to get. Big difference. That's the, the shotgun technique in marketing is what most people go after which is a certain overall brand awareness style that you can run that way. But if you want to get really targeted, you want to get really driven on your ROI and results, you need to have the right people to go after. Would you say that's more for larger ticket items or you think it's full? full I think spectrum? Be, it could be used in a lot of different verticals. This, this week, Ricky and I sat down, we we're pulling data that, I mean, we have lists of every single business owner in Kansas City. Like we know first, last name, we know what the business is that we, they own. We know their email addresses. We know their phone address, their, their phone numbers. We know all this info about them that we can then do these email drip campaigns to those people. And that's, we were talking about AI earlier. Now you utilize AI correctly and you can personalize messages to all these people and you can send out a thousand emails in a day that are targeted that says, hey Dalton, I know you own company X, Y, and Z. These are three things that you can do to increase your marketing in 2024 for this industry. And then if you want to schedule a call to discuss marketing further, when's a great time to meet or you know, whatever it is. But it's like now you have so much more detail on that individual instead of us just saying like, hey, yeah, I mean, Kansas City, you open up audience full speed on Meta. I mean, you have a 2.5 million person audience. Costs a lot of money to reach 2.5 million people. And now, let's say you reach the 2.5 million people because if you're just running reach ads and you're spending all that, that's gonna cost you probably what, 25,000, 30,000 roughly? That, I would, yeah, I mean, you're probably for reach like, and that just maybe means around two dollars per thousand yeah. on reach. That means you came on the screen, but did they stay on it or do what? that? Yeah. That's just it blowing yeah. out there, just hoping to come across their feed. But now you look at a frequency level, and that's how many times somebody's seeing something. Your frequency level is not over two, so you're probably capped at two on your frequency level on reach ads. So now all of a sudden you're blowing out Kansas City, and it's costing you thirty grand a month, and you just hope and pray that the right 3,000 people see our ad. Or you get detailed on your your audiences, you get the right audience, and now we say, hey, now we have 3,000 business owners. We have all their info. Let's directly just target these people. Spend, spend that 30,000, we can spend 4,000. And we know the right people are seeing what we're putting out there. But there's also a lot of stuff that goes out that we keep really broad. I want the the overall brand awareness to happen. I know that not every single person that needs to see what we're doing needs to be a business owner. To where there's certain ad styles like podcasts, we run ads on the podcast all the time. I keep it super broad. I don't need that super niche down. I want people coming in that are learning about business. Probably not a business owner yet. I want somebody that wants to learn about marketing. They may be thinking about getting into the marketing space. I want somebody that's interested in content. That may not be into content yet. So there's a lot of different people that we want in that that funnel. So that's a completely different move than the the data driven side. So I think that that's something is going to it, it is going to be used across a lot of different verticals, and I think it's going to become more and more and more important as the privacy levels keep increasing on our 
phones and computers and everything. So you're talking about privacy. What's changing on privacy? So they're just tightening up on, used to be phones would track across everything. iOS 14, I mean, that happened, what, a year and a half ago, roughly? Uh, two. Maybe two. Two, two years, years in October. So it's like, uh, iOS 14 made it to where the tracking across apps, now when you download an app, it asks you if you want to be tracked or not. To where what that's doing is when you were clicking out an app, we were pinging you everywhere you went. So you would put pixels on the back ends of everything and then it would make it to where when you clicked out, we pretty much had you in an audience and you say, hey, you want to retarget anyone that's clicked through to a website? That's how you would click through to a website Then you would just get pounded with stuff all the time. Now we can go after video viewers and keep them on platform. That's why video became so dominant so quickly was the people that were doing it correctly. You know, it's now you watch a video and you, if you watch 15 seconds of it, now we have you in the audience and now we can retarget video viewers to where it makes it to where that retargeting has completely shifted on the way that you do it. But I mean, they're going to get more and more. I mean, Google's working on tightening up their spam folders that emails are going to need to be more personalized to break through those spam folders to where you, you're going to have to make sure that you have the right audiences and the correct, the emails are built out correctly. They're, they're not super gimmicky. They're not super salesy because those get flagged all day, every day. I just watched a deal on emails today of usually right when you create an email, it'll just straight go to spam just because like so many people have view it, respond, engage with it. Uh, there's a way with the new Google update, they can go through and check to see if your emails are passing through as spam, which I think we all need to do, which is something because I know I got an email from, it was someone within the company and they're like, yeah, I sent you an email. I'm like, no, and I go in my spam folder, it's in there. I was like, oh, but that's where it's just, it took me a while to get out of spam because I remember I was sending emails a lot in the beginning round I created it. Google did that from the same domain. <laughs> what? It spammed out like one of our MMG emails. Mm -hmm. Google kind of sucks sometimes. It, it does. <laughs> but it's, it's if, wild. say you like- think you'd have a filter for that one. Say right? I'm sending a bunch of emails, Dane sent a bunch, and then it's like, we create another email that's even it's under our account. It'll still send it spam because there's accounts that do go out and make thousands of emails and then they just burst them out. And that's typically what goes into your But the, That's why when you're doing email campaigns that you're gonna have to get more and more disciplined on the way that you do them, that they, they're they reading that off of open rates. So if you're sending out groves of email and no one's opening them, they're reading that really quickly saying like, hey, this is probably a spam account. Nobody opens what they send. But if people are opening your emails consistently, they're gonna say, okay, this probably isn't a spam account. So you have to get better with your hooks. You those hooks have to be something that's personalized to that person because every single time I get an email that has my name in it, in that tagline, most of the time I open it. But it's normally some sort of quick hook that's like, okay, how, they know my name. Like, so you click on it, but it's, now think about if you get an email with your name in it in that tagline, you're probably gonna open it. So I do check my spam folder and I'll go in and there's some stuff in there that I think is useful. And I always back out of that. I never click any of the links. <laughs> Heads up, if you do click links and emails, don't. But you can go. You I can click links and emails just if something looks super You foreign. click on the email to read the deal because I got I keep getting email every two weeks. It says it's from Logan Scott. It says Logan Scott in the deal. And it's like, hey man, I need to have my uh, uh, routing number for my bank changed. Uh, can you click through so we can get all that set up? That sounds like a scam. <laughs> so, but then you click the email, but that could be something in a corporate company. Someone needs their routing number changed on the bank because they move banks. So depending on the size, uh, that goes to someone in HR, they click on it, bam. It happened to the casinos, we talked about it. Someone yeah. in their HR company, they click the link and they- fished. Yeah, they got taken down for $50 million. Yeah, they went after MGM and then Caesars. Both of them, they got in the same way, like through their accounting department, just acting like employees that they needed things changed. And like once they clicked in that, it just opened up their firewalls like right inside. Huh. And then they pretty much got full access inside. And then 
pretty much held like Locking I think Caesars out. paid it, and I think they started off at like fifteen million or something, paid it. MGM tried. I don't remember the whole entire thing, but MGM said they weren't paying, and they doubled it or whatever. Then they shut down a bunch of their stuff, but it's it can happen. So I, I definitely think that there's there is a lot of spam in the email space for sure. But rabbit hole. It's also like I think that that data side on how you conversate with those people is going to become very crucial, and the skill level of what you're doing in email campaigns is going to become very very crucial on i mean recently i've been getting like loom videos and we have one of the guys in the office that's working on those and but it's a video that was like it was mmg they had our website pulled up they had our it was a full digital audit pretty much that somebody recorded and then sent over and i was like okay this is impressive so that's something that we're doing now but it's people aren't looking at their full digital footprint normally all at one time. You talk to a normal business owner, you're like, oh, what social platform do you I'm like, uh, Facebook, we're trying to do some Instagram. Like, are you on YouTube? Are you on TikTok? Are you on LinkedIn? Are you, what do you do on your Google My Business Daily? What do, what do all, what does your whole digital footprint look like? Because I think a lot of times people miss out on, a, they get so hyper-focused on one thing, it's because they don't have the time to do them all that it does take a small army to get it all done. But it's like, okay, now I decide that I'm gonna work on like posting all these so I don't have time for the content side. Now my content isn't right that's going out. I don't use TikTok and YouTube because I don't have any video. And it's like, so now it's, you're dropping the ball somewhere that at the end of the day, you want the highest level of exposure, which equals high traffic, which equals more sales. And people, most of the time don't even understand how to get the exposure and then they don't know how to retain the traffic. And then all they're doing is just asking for sales all the time. If you're just asking for sales all the time, it's probably not going to work. I can guarantee you it's not going to work. That if you follow us on social, you see stuff from the podcast all the time. You see taco reviews, you see fit check Fridays, you see that the culture of what we do, but it's because people buy from people that generates leads all the time that people see what we do. We walk the walk every single day. And it's, I think in social too many times, it's just, and in emails and whatever it is, it's just, they pop right in, they ask for the sale. Instead of asking for the sale next time, give value to someone. How do you give value to someone? That if you have knowledge on plumbing, I prefer, I would follow you if you just gave me value on things that I could fix around the house myself. And maybe I can fix some of these little things, but the day that my toilet is busted out and it is leaking everywhere, that's way beyond my means of fixing it. First person I think of is Dalton. If it's behind yeah. a wall or under something, that's that's above my level. But think about that in like every vertical that you're in. Instead of trying to sell cars to people all the time, educate people on how to buy cars. Instead of trying to sell people marketing all the time, edu educate people how to become better at marketing. That's why we've started this. We talk with business owners. We talk with people all the time. We, I, we will tell people how to do it. That doesn't mean they will do it. We work with growing businesses because this is something that they figure out how much time it really takes to do it all. And they're like, okay, yeah, that's over my head. And I want it done correctly. So it's any space that you're in, educate, entertain, educate, entertain. If you take one thing from this whole podcast, I hope that's something that you can take away from this is understanding that take one of those positions instead of just trying to sell people. Um, is there any other topics that we want to hit? I really feel like the AI one was a pretty good. I, I feel like yeah, the two we covered. There's a lot to talk about. Yeah, there's there. a lot. If we can have a five, 10 hour podcast sitting here, just going over the topics that we go over every week. Remember in the very early days, how hard it was to have an hour long podcast of Dude, it used to feel about. like an eternity. <laughs> I know we were like trying, like grasping for something. And now it's like, dude, this is all we talk about all the time. 45 more minutes. What are we going to talk about? Yeah. Damn, that was 15 minutes. We had like somebody asked a really good question. <laughs> we covered all 10 of our uh, ideas. Now, I think the only the only statistic statistic I saw that I was kind of surprised on was Instagram users. 30 percent of Instagram users only look at reels, not even go through the main feed. They just straight go to reels and that's all they use it for. And I think that's, I mean, 
I think that is because of TikTok. What yep. TikTok has done is that does have the largest engagement of any platform than any other social. So like there's times I get on Instagram and I'll be at scrolling through reels. And I only under, I don't even know if I'm on TikTok or Instagram. <laughs> Now they're like, getting pretty good looking pretty similar now. Yeah. I mean, they knocked it off really well, but it's once again, I think that's what's driving the attention span so low and it's the podcast. People are like, why do you post reels all the time of the podcast? That's what drives people into listening to the podcast. The long version is somebody gets a nugget out of a 60 second clip or a 30 second clip and they go, okay, I want to go listen to the rest of it, but it's, you're not going to capture somebody right out. That's like you going to see a movie and never seeing a trailer to it. They just have a picture of it up front. You're like, yeah, I want to see that. I did go right. to a movie last week and I didn't see the trailer until and the tickets was, were already bought. It was a so. bad choice. <laughs> bad choice. I slept. And that's at a that's at a movie theater where you have ten options, not a hop on Spotify and you have a hundred thousand podcasts. Yeah, true, <laughs> true. That sometimes, hey, sometimes I got Netflix, find something I never watched trailers. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we've talked I, to I people. I waste 45 minutes <laughs> and then I figure out I don't like it. You're like, ah, this actually sucks. Yeah, we've talked to people that have had some monster names on their podcasts and they've just never marketed their podcasts or put out mm -hmm. the short forms that if they just probably did that alone, they could have huge podcasts, but it's just people have to see, see what it's going to entitle, like what it's going to come with. What benefit do they get from listening to this? that I feel that there's a lot of business owners out there. There's a lot of people in the marketing space that can get a lot of benefit from the last hour that we've spoke. I'm trying to think of whether or not I've listened to any podcasts that I came across via, like just through Spotify or something like that. I've never listened to a podcast that way. Like it's, it's typically been, I follow the person and their personal brand on social. I'm like, oh, they have a podcast. And then I go down that route. I've caught a lot like, I mean, that's how Theo Vaughn blew up was TikTok, like dudes all over TikTok and you watch these like 30 second clips and like, dude's funny. And then all of a sudden, like one night we're sitting in the living room with YouTube pulled up watching him and Shane Gillis on the TV. <laughs> and it's like, girls are super pumped. <laughs> but it's like just leading that into it is you saw all these like small, like micro clips of the whole thing. And you're like, okay, I, it's like seeing those little clips of movies that people put on TikTok now. And it's like, I've went back and watched movies from like 2004, because I saw some clip. I was like, oh, that was a good movie. Movies from 2004, pretty hard to find for free. They True. they make you rent every single one now. <laughs> <laughs> but I just think that there's a lot that comes from that short form content that leads people people into the, the long form content that if, when we're capturing an hour of someone's time, it's a, a lot of time to someone and it's, you have to have those value points. You have to have the reels cut all the time. You have to do those things to get someone in. And it's, I think that's where a lot of people miss it. Same thing with a business. I mean, a podcast is like a business. You have to put eyeballs on it. People have to know what you do to be able to use you. If you have a business and no one knows about you, how are they supposed to use you? And it's, it drives me crazy when we talk to business owners and they talk about how they want to grow a business, how they want to do all these things but they actively are doing nothing to do that. That they're just waiting for something to fall out of the sky. That's just going to change everything. If you were a business owner, look at the last 12 months. What things have you implemented? If you are a business owner that said that say you want to grow, because I have people ask us all the time, how have you guys grown a company so quickly? We do exactly what we talk about all the time. If we sit with a business owner that says that they want to grow a business and you look at the last 12 months, you can, I can see how badly they want to grow a business. If you do absolutely nothing online and you're just sitting there, I mean, the writing's on the wall. We can all have goals. We can all have dreams, but the actions we do every day are what's actually going to make those a reality. To where if, same thing in a personal life. If you talk about fitness and you never see the inside of a gym and you never eat well, I don't really believe you. It goes hand in hand with business. If you talk about wanting to have financial freedom, but you do nothing to change it every day, I don't really believe you. Towards 
actions speak the loudest. Your social platforms, your digital presence online is what people find first in today's world. So business owners, take a step back, go look at your full digital footprint. What does, what does the average person that doesn't know who you are, doesn't know your business, if they find you online, what do they think of your business? If you're not a business owner, great place to start is look 12 months ahead, plan accordingly. Yeah. So that's what I got. I think we touched on a lot of great things. I think there's a lot of stuff happening in 2024 marketing wise. I think, I mean, we're chasing a moving target 100% of the time. So final thoughts? I think, uh, I think you summed it up pretty good there. Final thoughts? AI is a tool. The better you are using it, the better results you'll get. Hell yeah. Final thoughts? I think I'm good. I'm good down here. All good. Once again, thank you for joining us. If you have any questions marketing-wise, feel free to shoot us DM, send us a postcard, email. I don't really care how you contact us. Just contact us. We'll help you out. But that's M3 Podcast. Peace. Thanks for listening to the M3 Podcast. M3 Podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. Want to learn more? Check us out on Instagram at Moss Marketing Group, on Facebook at Moss Marketing 58, or on our website at mossmarketinggroup.com.